I was born on January 9, 1837, to American parents in London, England, where shortly after having me, they moved back to the U.S. and settled in New York City. My parents did all they could for me, and I never had any formal education of any kind. But that never stopped me from becoming a self-taught chemist. I got my first job clarifying kerosene from whale oil, where all the knowledge and skills were taught on the job. Before those days, kerosene was the only fuel source keeping homes and streets lit at night. For a few years, things went well, and I thought I had a safe and secure future, but then I hit rock bottom because of a new and cheaper alternative, petroleum fuel. Competition was strong, and I struggled to put food on the table as I slowly watched person after person getting fired from the company. It didn't take long until I was laid off and no one hired me because my job was seen as obsolete. In the blink of an eye, I had nothing and I was nothing. I knew that if I didn't innovate or try something new, I would also be obsolete. Instead of trying to fight the petroleum industry, I decided to join them by visiting the oil fields to see for myself. So in 1859, at 22 years old, I made the difficult decision to leave what was my home and use my life savings to buy a train ticket to Titusville, Pennsylvania. When I got there, everyone cared about the same thing, oil. They wanted to make a quick buck and jumped on the bandwagon, confident that they would all make it big. But I had other plans. I wanted to hear from the everyday worker and randomly took a tour and began speaking with the people no one cared about the drillers, and asked them questions about their job, hoping that would lead to something more. When I was done, I reached in to shake their hand to say goodbye, and I immediately noticed how incredibly soft and smooth their hands were. It didn't make sense to me, because he was an outdoor driller working outside with his bare hands. Just when I was going to ask him, I noticed another driller rubbing his hands and arms with the black goo coming from the drill rods. When I asked what it was, they called it rod wax, and it was a useless byproduct that came from the crude oil that would stick as they drilled down. When I asked why they rubbed it on their hands, they said it helped heal cuts so they would occasionally grab some and rub it in. I knew instantly that this was what I really came for, and I immediately asked if I could have samples. They did better and gave me buckets for free, telling me it was worthless anyway, as they laughed me off. As soon as I returned home, I began experimenting and trying to figure out its chemical properties and if it really was some magic healer. Everyone called me a fool for turning down actual oil and wasting my time on something oil companies gave away for free. To them, I was just some poor, uneducated chemist chasing after an imaginary product that would never work. There were times when I questioned if any of this was even worth it, and that maybe they were right. But I'd look down at my buckets of foolish rod wax and remembered that I had a goal. So I ignored them and decided to pursue my passion. I poured every minute of my life into what I believed in. And after 10 years of experimenting and perfecting my product, I finally did it. I triple purified the black rod wax into a clear, odorless, and smooth jelly and learned that it actually didn't have any healing properties. Instead, it acted more like a protective layer, lowering the risk of infection. While doctors were still using gauze, I had discovered a new type of Band-Aid that protected people from infections where even a simple cut killed people. I told pharmacies and begged doctors to use it to help fight infections and heal skin, but every store I went to said the same thing. No. And it was because I was uneducated in their eyes. They turned me down and accused me of lying, being a fraud, a cheat. I felt like my chance at ever making it had been wasted on hundreds of jaws filled with jelly with no one using it because they didn't believe it worked. And then it hit me. What if I hurt myself and showed them it really did? I got the crazy idea to become my own guinea pig 
and went around the city, drawing up large crowds around me, then intentionally cutting and burning myself, sometimes even with acid. Then I would spread the wonder jelly onto my wounds to show people the truth just as I had seen it with my own eyes in the oil fields. I'd show them my old cuts and burns and how those were healed along with my dry skin. I even gave free samples to people to try for themselves when they got injured. Within a few weeks, every person began requesting my petroleum jelly at every pharmacy, and orders began to flood in. It became an overnight success, and it wasn't only because of my demonstrations, but because it was something that actually worked. It had a purpose, and unlike the many people who said it was worthless, it was actually worth more than any amount of money, because it pioneered a new path towards medicine and saved countless lives. I began seeing it in every household and hospitals, making it the standard in any skin-related problem. By the 1870s, I began manufacturing my petroleum jelly full-time, shipping it worldwide, selling at a rate of one jaw every minute. Even though I loved calling my petroleum jelly Wonder Jelly, I knew it deserved a more proper name. So, in 1872, I changed the name to what you know it today as Vaseline. It was amazing how many uses people found Vaseline with. Things like putting it on babies to prevent diaper rash, using it to shine leather, putting it on hair to moisturize, or using it as a makeup remover. And to my unimagined mind, it was even taken to the North Pole by Commodore Robert Perry, where he used it on his skin and even on his equipment because it prevented frostbite and would prevent rust. The best use was when World War I broke out, and I proudly learned that I was able to help U.S. soldiers when they used it to treat cuts and bruises, preventing infections. It was a worthless black goo found on oil drills given for free. It took a decade of my life to develop and believe in a product that would possibly never work. And when no one helped me, I continued to help others by working on what I trusted in. This is what excited me most during 10 years of failing. It wasn't the possible riches of fame, but the opportunity to truly save lives and help others in more ways than one. Most of all, it was the decision to innovate and produce a product that would outlive and outperform anything before or after it. And after 140 years, I'm proud to say that it can still be found in nearly every household and every shelf exactly as it was when I first jotted myself. My name is Robert Augustus Chesabrew, and I have invented a new and useful product from petroleum, which I have named Vaseline. Born January 9th, 1837, died September 8th, 1933.